Welcome to the Michael Cooley podcast on rethinking leadership. In these episodes, we will look at leadership with a fresh perspective and take your leadership effectiveness to the next level. For more information, go to cooleyinstitute.com and follow Michael's continuous learning insights on social media. Thank you, sir. Uh, as I mentioned, and I will make a, a brief introduction of yourself. Uh, Michael uh, was introduced uh, to me and to the and to the group by Mr. Fernando Turner, who they both they both used to attend uh, Harvard Business School. They were colleagues when they were uh, pursuing mm -hmm. their masters in public administration. Mr. Coley has a, Mr. Coley has a wide um, uh, experience and a very I will say very uh, good and excellent uh, educational background. He's a professor and alumni from Harvard University and Princeton. Um, he has, a, uh, as I said, a big wide uh, educational background, He's starting from a master's in uh, management and public policy from Harvard University, focusing on the field of concentration on globalization, business and government from Princeton. He also has a PhD research fellow from Maastricht University. He has a focus. He has been focusing a lot on leadership and governance, and also he has made also an executive program on leadership from University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Um, he has uh, he has a background or a bachelor of business administration from American University in Beirut. Well, uh, he has uh, he's an author of many books. Uh, regarding uh, leadership and corporate governance and corporate leadership, multicultural context, more than 30 years of experience, as I said, on international corporate experience. He has spent his life in learning about leadership, uh, focusing on the top schools around the world, including, of course, Harvard and Princeton. He has practiced his, uh, leadership as, a, I would say, as part, as part of his main field of concentration. Uh, Mr. Coley also is a World Bank Fellow and a global thinker and author of different books, including keynote speaker from many, many places from the globe about leadership, strategy, and international politics. Um, really, I mean, I would say that the best thing to mention I will focus in is that currently he's an advisor, an executive educator, and a board member of different uh, companies, international speaker, and a corporate executive. He's currently the president of the of uh, Cambridge Institute for Global Leadership. And I would like to transfer uh, to uh, ask Mr. Turner to say a few words and since you know him better from your time in Harvard, uh, Mr. Turner, if you could share uh, with us a few words, please do so. Thank you. Well, I already talked a little bit and say, and say some greetings to, to Michael Cooley, uh, remembering our time in school together. We haven't seen him in 50 years. Uh, time flies, Michael. <laughs> and Michael is uh, one of the most uh, active members of, of that generation in the Kennedy School of Government in Harvard. I think uh, he's a very uh, uh, mature person with leadership. Uh, and leadership, as he says, is a word that is very commercialized and is used constantly. But um, it's, a, it's a very important uh, quality and activity, we will say. And um, I think the stress of, of Michael's uh, quality characteristics is, um, is mobilizing people, uh, not uh, thinking, not sending uh, messages, not retweeting, not presenting videos, but mobilizing people. Okay, Go ahead. thank you so much, uh, Samuel, for your uh, elaborate introduction. I appreciate that, and thank you for facilitating this event over the past few days. You've made it very, very easy for us to connect. Thank you. I appreciate your effort. It's very impressive that how you include a diverse and rich uh, number of people. So uh, whoever is uh, attending now is participating in this uh, webinar. 
I would like you to help me and make this an active conversation because I am sure we can all learn from each other. I will do now, what I will do is I will try to use my perspective from the 30 years or so that I spent in the media. I spent much of my time in Reuters in more than 22 countries and my last job was I was the CEO for Reuters in the Middle East. So, so, um, so I always may try to maintain this global perspective looking at news from a global dimension. And I will also introduce my, uh, my, uh, at, uh, my interest also in the subject of leadership to see how we can look at things um, from a global perspective but also introduce the leadership dimension. My talk will be divided into three parts. Part number one, I will go from macro and zoom in into the micro. So I will talk about the global challenges uh, post the COVID-19 uh, epidemic uh, so that I can then move to the third part to suggest how we exercise leadership uh, from the perspective of the global community so that we adapt, uh, survive and thrive uh, in the world in the current reality and in the world that is coming post uh, COVID-19. So I'm going to go for the ma from the macro uh, to, the, to the micro. I'm going to share my slides. If you have any comments to make on the subjects, please jump in because as I said, let's step in into our collective experience and, uh, and intelligence. Now, um, the be to begin with, I would like to highlight a number of key principles, almost philosophical principles, that draw the parameter, define the parameter of this talk and my thinking in general, especially in regard to our subject. So this is the definition. Everything I say <coughs> is going to consider that whatever the points I will mention now are the pillars of this conversation. Number one, that life is dynamic, life is not static. So nothing is fixed. Everything is in constant motion from the Big Bang uh, till uh, eternity and even before the Big Bang, you know, we don't know the universe and every component of the universe is a state of motion. So that's the first pillar or fact of life or nature of reality, that life is dynamic. The second thing is because it's dynamic, nothing stays the same and everything is changing, as you know. So we're always living in a state of constant change. The third element, <coughs> it is called the concept or the principle of entropy. And this is the second uh, uh, law of thermodynamics. Basically, entropy means that over time, things degenerate, things move into chaos. Everything in the end will collapse and die. Hence, the importance of paying attention to things. So even if we do nothing, life will continue in a dynamic and changing state, but it will eventually go towards entropy, i.e. a state of collapse. That's why we need to pay attention to things. That's why the concept of adaptation is so important, because if you don't adapt in an environment that's dynamic, that's changing, where the general trend of things is going by default into collapse, into a state of chaos, then you will have an existential problem and we will die. And this is something to remember at all levels, at the personal, family, organizational, business, you know, country, and also at a global community level. The other point is that you can't defeat the fundamentals. If you don't deal with the fundamentals, as stated by the laws of physics, as stated of the laws of human behavior, then it will not work. There are no shortcuts in life. You can't, over time, ignore the fundamentals. Tactically, may, you might do cut and paste, but without looking at the foundational issues, without looking at the fundamentals, then things will collapse. So we have to keep in mind always the fundamentals. The sixth point is the concept of actions and consequences every action we take has consequences and every action we don't take if we have to there will also be consequences so there is no escape of the concept of the philosophical concept of consequences the only thing you get to choose is the poison 
the nature of the poison you drink. There is no escape from the poison if you don't deal with the fundamentals, if you don't adapt, if you don't take care of things so they don't fall into the concept of entropy because things are changing and things are always in a dynamic state. So consequences are important. The last point uh, or before the last is leadership. We need leadership because without leadership, people will make the wrong actions. Your organization, you as a head of a family will make the wrong decisions, wrong actions, and that will lead to negative consequences. And without leadership, you, you people will ignore the fundamentals, will go into shortcuts, and that will create damage, and it will fail the process of adaptation. That's why leadership is super important in the context of what we will talk about now. The last point, which is not on this slide, is the concept of the impact of stress. Every time there is a stress on a system, laws of physics say the system will crack at its weakest point. Why am I saying that? Because COVID now is putting stress on the entire global community in all its dimensions. Every side, economic, you know, geopolitical, uh, social, you name it. And what's happening now is that wherever there is a crack, there is a point of weakness, that there is a point that hasn't adapted in the process of survival of going forward, it will be under pressure and it will crack. So what will I'll talk about now is especially highlighted because of the impact of COVID as it's putting the system, the entire global system and your entire organizations and families and maybe yourself also under stress. And that will make, as I said, the weakest point appear and collapse and come to the surface. All the tension will come to the surface. So these eight points are the parameters or the underlying philosophy of what I'm going to talk about from now on. Let's keep them in mind so that we can move forward. These are the pillars of our thinking. When we talk about global challenges, there are a number of global challenges, a number of them, starting with the classic global challenges like you know, the threat of nuclear war, like the threat of pandemics, like the threat of disintegration into you know collapse of the world order. There is the issue of food, issue of uh, water supplies, issue of education, issue of health, issue of overpopulation. There are many, many, many dimensions to the current and the foreseeable global challenges. What I will do, as you can see on this slide, I will highlight only five of them because talking about all of them is too much and is without the scope of this you know, um, brief uh, intervention. So I'm going to talk about these five pillars of the global challenges as they are now and as they will continue. And in terms of the impact that this ep pandemic that we're going through will, will take place. We went into phase one of the pandemic, then it calmed down and it's obvious that we're going now into phase two of this, especially as we go into, you know, uh, winter. So um, this is this haven't hasn't ended. And as per all the um, data that's coming from, you know, uh, from the IMF, from the World Bank and from the OECD and other organizations, it seems that um, whatever we had predicted in terms of impact on uh, global economy uh, on other aspects of our international community, um, the real impact will be much more. So what we're going to do now is talk about each of these and see how will they be impacted as we move forward. How does that make sense to you now? Is that fine? Is it clear? Is it okay? Okay. Yes, it's okay. Okay, okay. So that's the framework. Now, I'm going to talk about the issue of uh, geopolitical instability. This was the case before COVID-19 and this is the case now and it will further continue. These are global risks that were before COVID at the beginning of this um, um, uh, century and they continue now and COVID is making them even bigger. So the size of these challenges, the size of these global risks 
from a global perspective will increase if you are a businessman who are running who is running a global operation if you are part of a you know of a uh, in a government structure that is part of a global community if you're a global leader political leader you have to think in these terms because this is going to be the nature of reality that we will talk about the first one is the failure of national governance that's the first point that's the first risk what we're facing what we have been facing as a risk and will continue to face even more under COVID is that the national governance, the governance system within the countries because of the stress of COVID, right, is under the threat of being failed, of collapsing. Things like law and order, things like major, you know, the main institutions of the country. So COVID is putting all of these systems under threat. It, it was already under threat before due to the political tensions that happened uh, because of the trend of nationalization that was sweeping in many countries of the world. So that was putting the entire fabric of society under tension. COVID is making it under more stress. So we have that important risk to pay attention to, the failure of national governance system within the country, the rule uh, of law and the uh, institution that holds society together. The other one is the failure of um, regional and global governance systems. So things like uh, legal leagues, legal, legal uh, uh, alliances, uh, the United Nations, we already have seen uh, the tensions on the WHO. Um, and uh, the World Health Organization and other global entities also. So this already was under tension before COVID. After COVID, let's take WHO as an example. You've seen how the tension spread to that because of the way COVID was mentioned, um, was managed, and how this things was politicized. So there are regional tensions and now in the Middle East. I don't know if you're following up. There are tensions between, you know, Greece and turkey and there is the tensions between libya and in the gulf and in iran and uh, and uh, you know israel and there are tensions within uh, within europe and B brexit already was there before uh, before covid so you name it you name it uh, when it comes to regional and global governance systems these governance systems that were controlling and ensuring some stability, now they're under pressure because of the stress that uh, COVID has put on the economy and on society and on the local political systems and the international relations that binds countries together. So this is the second risk on a global geopolitical uh, uh, level. The third one is the state of collapse of or crisis um, uh, in some of the countries. So there is there has always been a, a danger that some states will collapse, fragile states will collapse uh, because they already were weak from inside. Now, COVID came and put the entire system under more stress. And as I said earlier, stress makes the system, a weak system, crack and disintegrate. So we're, we, that, that, that danger of collapsing state now is much more and that of course will put pressure on the geopolitical stability in the world. The last one is the civil unrest. We already are seeing that in many countries. I mean, look at Belarus, look at next to you, you know, your neighboring country, United Nations, how issues that have been centuries old, you know, under the skin of the society, they've been sitting there. The stress of COVID has, is bringing all of this to the surface. And there are many other issues will come to the surface. Uh, because that's the nature of reality. When you subject a system to pressure, it will start cracking down. So these four risks at a geopolitical level were already existent before, and now COVID will make them worse. So if you're a political leader, a business leader, working on a global com level, you have to keep these risks uh, in, uh, in sight so that you know how to plan strategically for your country and your society and your business. The second kind of risk at the global level that we're talking about is the economic crisis. Now, the economic crisis, of course, this has been one of the major ones next to the health crisis because the health, the COVID hit the economy in its heart bigger than, you know, far worse than we all expected. And 
This was highlighted in inflating the issue of inflation itself. There was already the risk of inflation before COVID. Now, with the way many countries are injecting cash, printing money to support their societies, their economies, you can imagine the, con the, the impact on inflation. And I have heard the report, and that's my view also, that this should continue. Uh, Europe and the world, the, the G20 and the United States, uh, especially inclu also including Europe, have already injected um, enough cash into the economy. And now there is need to ex inject even more cash and print more money and inject it into the economy. And that will raise the issue of inflation. And there are alarming uh, signals that if this did not happen, it will make the problem much worse. So um, it is recommended, highly recommended by all thinkers, especially ec economists, that this continue. We should not withdraw our injection of cash and support of the economy very fast so that we don't uh, repeat the mistakes that had happened in the previous recession in the early 2000s. We should maintain that and keep injecting because otherwise the consequences of uh, economic consequences of COVID will be much worse. But that has no escape except to influence uh, inflation. And, um, and we will see that inflation will continue uh, to rise uh, more than we expected or more than we were worried about before COVID started. The second one is the shortage of critical infrastructure. Well, there were already shortage of infrastructures before on the economic level, you know, um, communications, uh, roads, airports, uh, financial institutions, uh, you name it. All the elements, the infrastructural element of economy, many countries were suffering from shortages for that. COVID came and put all of these infrastructures under more stress. Uh, so countries that did not have enough communication system suffered. Countries did not have enough, you know, transportation system suffered. Countries did not have strong financial institutions and banks suffered because of COVID. So that is, has been highlighting, has been highlighted over the past few months because of uh, COVID. The third one is um, the fiscal crisis in many key economies. So many budgets now are in the red because of uh, because of the COVID and the impact on the economy. Not only that, many countries are defaulting, right? They will, or at least are expected to default in their domestic and global uh, debt because they can't afford it. They have to they are divert all resources to dealing with COVID. At the same time, they have to uh, fulfill their long term economic obligations to the international community and to their uh, to the entities that were lending them. Um, um, the money, but they have to make choices and they have to divert uh, finances and, and all the resources locally and that created all these uh, pressures. The, the, the other one is the high structural unemployment. I mean, before COVID, they were unemployment. Now, I don't need to elaborate on this. You can just look into your country and look into the United States and the big major economies and see how employment has been, you know, major major you know at a historic level now I have to say this that in the previous recessions usually the upper class community uh, the community that is armed with education and all the you know resources of adaptation you know this will escape there's no problem with that the middle class in this situation um, might also escape uh, some of the pressures because they have enough basic education to you know and tools to adapt I think what will happen in this situation now, because of COVID the, as a global threat, the lower part of the society, you know, will be hit most because of uh, the nature of, uh, of this uh, threat and the way it is, you know, social distancing and working from home. And, you know, you don't want people to come to your home. There's no, uh, there's no contact. So many people at the, bottom si at the bottom part of the pyramid will also be influenced and that will create many social problems. So these are also global challenges that are derived from the economic crisis. Of course, there's the issue of illicit trade because now it's chaos and the resources of the countries and the economies are mainly towards survival. So all kinds of illegal trades now will prosper, right? And the impact of that will appear sooner or later uh, because the priorities of the economies now are shifted into dealing with the 
with the pandemic. So this is the economic front uh, in terms of the current challenges and the foreseeable challenges under the pressure of uh, COVID-19. Now let's go to the climate, climate kind of challenges as the third component of the major global you know um, challenge that humanity is facing now before COVID, we already had the issue of extreme weather events we already had that right so now we will have it but we'll have it in terms of bigger impact because when you have a you know a major weather event happening and a major disaster happening the impact on a society that already is dealing with this pandemic is bigger because you know protection will be less immunity of the society will be less uh, priorities will shift to dealing with the crisis so problems will be much bigger because of this extreme weather condition the other point is the failure of the climate change mitigation processes and adaptation right um, before even before COVID, we had problems in uh, acknowledging the issues of global warming and we had you know during the obama or the, um, obama period um, before trump uh, and i'm not speaking politically here but as a fact of life uh, that the spirit was different after now the new admi current administration things change and the world um, um, mechanisms to deal with climate changes um, mainly um, were weakened and some of them uh, became uh, useless or became paralyzed so that even will have a bigger impact now as we go into the problems of um, of, uh, of COVID and the, the disintegration on the political level and on the global co cooperation level that uh, COVID has further accelerated because now we have more geopolitical tensions, we have uh, less collaboration and we have more disintegration so we have less opportunities to come together and deal with these uh, risks. The third one is the major the biodiversity losses and the ecosystem collapse because all resources now are going into dealing with the pandemic right so who can who has time now in terms of government priority to dealing with these issues yet you know you, you hear from i mean at least your continent how the rate of uh, the, the the disintegration of amazon forest has speeded up recently and people are not paying attention because there are other priorities so because of the pandemic uh, this threat this global risk uh, has increased of course they will become also the same for major natural resources their nature natural major natural disasters and because of human made environmental disaster just to give you an idea we have all heard how the when we were when there was a global lockdown how uh, it was clearly evident to the entire world uh, planet Earth became uh, started to recover. I mean, you, you heard how the canals in Venice became so clear that you could see dolphins and fish there, right? We could see uh, from India, the cities of India, you could see Mount Everest. Um, the same thing for Europe. Uh, the climate started recovering and uh, pollution and noise and the way the planet was shaking due to all of this economic movement and movement of people. So it became evident during that lockdown period is the impact that civilization or humanity is having on the global uh, ecosystem and global climate and i expect that when um, after this is over all of this argument will be used and the tensions between those who uh, argue against the reality of global warming and global threats or uh, environmental threat and those who are uh, supporting uh, the evidence that this exists will this tension will be even further increased because uh, what happened during COVID the lockdown provided uh, rare evidence about the impact that human beings are having on nature and the future of humanity in general now I'm going to go into the technological uh, the, the, um, threats that are facing humanity and how this has been further increased due to uh, the COVID-19 and there will be even a bigger challenge after in the post-COVID-19 world. The first one is the um, adverse consequences of technological advances. I'll just give you an example what that means. We have all been hearing about the impact of artificial intelligence and how this face recognition systems and surveillance and how all of this you know has issues when it comes to 
um, privacy issues, when it comes to human rights, when it comes to confidentiality, when it comes to you know respecting um, uh, respecting um, the the laws and order that guard. Uh, uh, human uh, interaction and their confidential in the dynamics now because of the pandemic uh, this has d d f fallen behind as a priority now you have all these applications that track your where you are and they track also who have been you in, in touch with and and just think of China as an example how um, all of these mechanisms that track people say surveillance people uh, are now easily in use and the question is, this has been already a threat before COVID as a, as a technological you know, governance threat for humanity. So after COVID now, it will become even worse because people have uh, made them as a second priority because of the threat of you know, health. And now there is the danger that they become part of life and they become part of our new reality. So all of this has increased the risk of these technological advances on humanity to go forward. The other one is the breakdown of critical information infrastructure. <sighs> what does this mean? This means, my friend, now this has, the, the COVID problem has shown the importance of having, you know, using internet for commerce, for interaction, and the way we're the interacting now, and how things moved in that direction. Now, problems will appear uh, if, as we continue to have more, uh, lean more on this, on using the, this technology, that these systems might collapse the current global infrastructure and even local one as we move heavily into using them. I mean, it's just a miracle that the internet has not crashed on the global level with all this traffic that happened after COVID. But as this continues, as this becomes the new norm, as you know, <coughs> this pressure will continue at the global level, at, but mainly in some countries, especially in developing countries, um, they will not be able to cope with it and they will not even have enough money to upgrade it because they spend most of their money on dealing with the economic issues and the health issues. So that even opened the doors to uh, cyber attacks because now, you know, in the past you used to be inside your organization to log into the server, you used to do it internally. Now people are working from home and they're logging into their servers externally. So all these firewalls now have become vulnerable. So people can easily go into these servers, right? And the issue of cyber attacks and cyber security has become more highlighted because of the, the COVID thing. And we already, this was already a problem in political issues, you know, when we were talking about interventions in elections in the United States and in Germany and in other places. Now, as, as this, these firewalls are becoming more vulnerable, because our, of our reliance on you know this uh, technology now, uh, this this issue will become even a bigger risk as we move forward. The last part in the technological threats is the issue of the massive incidents of data fraud and threat. Because now we're dealing now mainly it's all uh, online. So uh, the original threat of of fraud and and identity theft were are now much bigger. Because what choices do you have now except doing business through 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 the te through this internet technology? Now there is also issue of broadband. There is not enough available enough in many of especially developing countries. There is issue that in many countries there is not enough infrastructure for you know brick and mortar co organizations to have a digital infrastructure to move their business digitally so they will eventually suffer and vanish because they can't do business anymore when people are you know uh, asked to uh, maintain social distancing and <coughs> to stay home so all of these problems on a on a on an international level have increased in scale uh, in the post covid world the last point as you know is that our health system was already suffering in the past now COVID has, of course, as you know from Mexico and other countries, Brazil, it is a disaster what's happening there. India, you know, as I was reading yesterday, 76,000 cases, you know, in one day. Can you imagine 76,000 cases? This is what's recorded. God knows how many hundreds of thousands are not uh, detected and they're spreading uh, COVID, uh, this uh, corona everywhere. So already this was a problem for many countries in the world including the bigger countries, the, the, the first world countries. So this has now proven to be a major, major issue. And one of the threats to humanity is 
that we have to deal with this as soon as possible. It is expected that it is by norm, by default, every year we have two uh, COVID-like uh, pandemics that start, but then they eventually die. Two per year. We don't hear about. We heard some of them, MERS, SARS, and other ones. Uh, but with current, with the current collapsing or at least suffering uh, of the global health system, can you imagine if we have a new one coming from China or other places? I mean, the entire medical community is already uh, under so much pressure and exhausted. Uh, hospitals are are out of space and technology is not catching up. So this is going to be a major survival issue. It was before. It was before and many people spoke about it and asked that we are ready but we p humanity we did not uh, listen of course because we always operate in a crisis management mentality but now it is first hand and we have to allocate resources to build up this uh, this reality in this um, in this in this post covid global uh, global challenge we have to create new global protocols at the global level you can't now afford to hide such information from the world. You have to immediately inform the entire planet and you have to make sure that there are enough immunity system within your healthcare infrastructure that takes care of such events if they, inc if they start, if they come up in the future. So these, my friends, uh, are a summary or sort of a global overview of the main challenges to humanity, to the global community, to planet Earth, uh, that existed just before COVID-19 and that exists now and that has been inflated and highlighted and increased in risk as global risks right after COVID-19. As I said, I haven't mentioned the risk of, you know, um, tensions uh, between um, you know, the superpowers. I haven't mentioned about, you know, China and the United States and, you know, this multipolar system and the reorganization of the global order. Uh, Henry Kissinger, I'm sure most of you know who he is, uh, spoke a few months ago about life will be completely different after, you know, COVID, the entire world order will change. Uh, he didn't say why. He didn't say how. He left it vague. Uh, I agree with him, of course, but maybe it has been exaggerated a little bit, but still, fact of matter is that we can see the tensions already we can already see them so so all of these all of these now are part of reality and have been increased i mean before covid already china and, um, and the united states had already tensions and after covid it became far more and uh, and expected that things will further increase as we uh, move further in italy you know europe the disintegration of europe um, who knows what will happen if there is a wave two of uh, uh, coronavirus, you know, spread in Europe. So we're talking about major, major global threat. And unfortunately, we have a major issue of global leadership now that looks at not just national level challenges, but global level challenges and forgets the part that we are all connected, that if they, you know, if they messed up in China, Mexico will pay. If they mess up in Mexico, you know, I don't know, Russia will pay. So this is a fact. It's now it's more obvious than ever. But unfortunately, we live in a time where uh, there are many politicians, but there are not many state people, you know, state m politicians, state level of historic uh, magnitude who can look at with global perspective, who can look at entire humanity rather than domestic short term, you know, uh, shallow uh, politics. So if I look at every country, all of these flags that you see on the slide, each of them have their own problems. There is not a single country, as you know, doesn't have assets and doesn't have liabilities. So now is the time in the post-COVID uh, world that we know how to better use <coughs> and optimize the use of our your 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 assets, <coughs> your assets, and how to uh, intelligently deal with the challenges because. We can't afford to continue to having these challenges now with something like COVID or what's coming after COVID. When I talk about COVID, and I know you guys are fed up and tired uh, of this conversation because as we have, and many of these points maybe you've heard before and you know already. But when I speak about that, I don't mind repeating it. I'll tell you why. Because I am not sure this is going to be the end of the story. There is absolutely no guarantee 
no guarantee that next year, 2021, 2022, there might not be s something even then worse than COVID. Who knows? And what if COVID now uh, evolved into a much more dangerous uh, virus that spreads most, more effectively? So we're really going into a new phase of global threats. I don't see this as a coincidence. Uh, if you tie this, if you tie this with whatever we have been doing as humanity to planet Earth, all this arrogance, all this abuse, short-term thinking, absence of global leadership, if you tie this, the way we have been damaging this only single planet that we have in the entire solar system or the universe that we know that's really uh, habitable, right? What is happening now, COVID, right, might not be just, you know, and might just, just, once you know in a lifetime situation what if this is going to be a beginning of you know a series of genetic mutations that are at the same level what if this is going to be the nature of reality as we go forward is there going to be second kind of COVID and third kind of COVID so we have to look at the strengths and the weaknesses of our countries of Mexico of every country of the global community with a different level of urgency this is not a COVID situation. This is about a new reality because we don't know uh, if COVID was, uh, will ever disappear or will not mutate to even a worse virus or they might not be sisters and brothers, brothers of COVID that might even make this threat um, you know, miniature or, mi or minor compared to what's coming next. Now, all of this, all of this demands leadership. All of this demands leadership. Remember I said from the fundamentals, there are pillars in life, actions and consequences. Remember I said that. If we don't do the right actions, we will suffer the wrong consequences. So COVID will not disappear by itself. Your weaknesses will not go by themselves. And if you ask me, the real problem, if you ask me, if you really now, if I'm going to wear my leadership hat, the real problem is not COVID. The real problem, my friend, is the absence of leadership at a domestic level, at a regional level, at an international level. Because problems is the default nature of life, of reality. There will always be problems. But what's missing, what's, what, is, what demands our contribution is solutions. And who brings solution? Especially at a social and a group, group level. It is the task of leadership to bring solutions. How does it do that? By mobilizing people. What is leadership? Leadership is about mobilizing leader, le people to move forward towards a good purpose. There are three components for leadership. Mobilization, because without mobilization there's no leadership. People, because it's all about people. And the third one is a good purpose. Otherwise, if it's a bad purpose, then it becomes manipulation. And that becomes evil. It becomes malicious. It becomes malevolent. Right? So the real problem is not COVID. The real problem is not that we have global challenges and threat. There will always be global challenges. If this is the year 2200, there will be global threat and challenges. Look at history. It's not but a, a big story of global challenges and the way humanity dealt with it in terms of successes and failures and the prices that were paid for that. So I want to talk now about how do we lead transformation in our societies, in our communities, in our countries, in our families, in our departments and organizations, so that we do whatever it takes so to be ready to deal with these challenges, whether they are domestic, departmental, familiar, personal, uh, social, you know, provincial, country, local, international risk. You need leadership that will lead transformation. And what I'm, why am I talking about transformation? I'm not talking about change. Change is about incremental change, incremental uh, modifications, incremental, incremental adjustment that happen, you know, gradually with time. And that's important and part of nature. But sometimes in nature, you have big spikes, either they are positive or negative. These big spikes that are a huge turn and shift in the nature of reality in the course of history and events require transformation which is a big big chunk of change transformation comes from the word transform so your form your entire being will 
be transformed trans it means change form means the way you look so it's a major change that's why i'm going to talk about uh, how to the, the dynamics of leading transformation and I'm, i made it deliberately practical so i'm going to give you practical step wearing my leadership expert hat or leadership interest hat so that this conversation becomes uh, practical and helps you otherwise i don't want to keep it on a macro philosophical and geopolitical level because that's you know that is fine in terms of consciousness but in the end leadership is about action it's not just just about theories and analysis and you know and interpretation we have to act you have to make an intervention there are three components for leadership observation we observe interpretation we interpret and analyze and the third one we intervene and what's intervention now it's about transformation so these are practical steps that you can use personally uh, in your challenges and i want you each to think about now so that you use yourself as a case study uh, for an use as a, a personal example in your own life whether you want your personal life your familiar life your departmental organizational social country responsibility whatever it is just think of a personal case study that thinks that needs needs transformation this is the following step will be what needs to happen so that you can lead transformation and if you are in the public sector in a political uh, community who is leading with these changes with the challenges that i talked about at the beginning of my intervention of this talk you can still use the same steps as a state leader as a statesman or a statewoman to deal with whatever is required to reshape your community to deal with these changes and even at a global level so let's go to the practical level so that there's a practical benefit to this um, to this uh, to this uh, to this conversation with you number one so what do you do when you lead transformation in your organization and community to deal with risks first thing is to understand my friends that the purpose of every organization every being everything that exists and is alive is to survive and to grow this is the fundamental fundamental philosophy that i use to think about life and to think about leadership everything we do everything we say we do it for the purpose of survival and growth there are no exceptions the reason we're having this conversation now is because of the thought and the perception and belief that when we have this conversation people who listen will enhance their level of consciousness and will add insights and will help them in their survival and growth journey so this is the fundamental issue Will you lead you transform so that you enhance the subject of survival the purpose of survival and growth that's why we do things the second thing is to do that because we live in an environment that continuously changing we have no choice but to go through the process of adaptation so leadership is leading people through the process of adaptation to survive in COVID-19 uh, uh, era and to survive and grow beyond or post the COVID-19 era the same thing for you you lead transformation in your company to survive in this new now situation new reality and to grow when you get out of this reality and things are more stabilized so that you go back to your growth purpose so leadership is about adaptation also and that's what you have to lead to in the process of transformation the third one my friend is uh, is there is no choice when it comes to this it's not a matter of choice leading transformation is not a matter of choice this is the, what you see now in the picture is a technological threat that that could have been solved by transformation nokia died because uh, they did not were not able to deal with the disruption that you know apple brought that ha disruption happened to the economy and they failed in adaptation and failed in transforming themselves and that's why as a company they died or they are almost dead at least compared to they used to be so there's not a matter of choice the same thing applies now there's not a matter of choice if we don't uh, know how to lead transformation so that we survive during the changes the challenges of COVID-19 we will die bodies of people who are collapsing and dying now by the thousands are dying because they're not able to adapt 
to dealing with the threat of the virus by producing the right immunity systems. So um, threats like COVID are also imposing that we go into uh, transformational leadership mode, not just technological one. The other one that we're facing now is the political and geopolitical tensions like the tensions we have now between the United States and China. These are also other reasons why we should go into the process of transformation because the world is changing geopolitically. So you have technological requirements or disruptions that demand leading transformation. You have uh, uh, physiological and biological reasons, health reasons, right, to your entire physical presence, and you have geopolitical also reasons that you have to adapt to through a process of transformation because definitely the world is changing and it's obvious that China and, and the United States are, are more and more into uh, a, um, a direction of collision. Today I read a report that says China has just opened the world's largest satellite manufacturing compound. They're going to be producing satellites by the masses, just like they produce shoes by the masses. Can you imagine the scale? China now will start producing satellites. So imagine the threat that that will impose, right? So, and it's out of control. Chinese technology now, the way they have been creating momentum, it will be hard to stop. And that will take more both countries into definitely a, a state of more tension and possible different kinds of levels of, uh, of, coll of collision. The other important element to do to lead transformation is what's happening next to you. And that's the, 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 the elections in the United States, because that will also shape the biggest country in the world economically and politically and militarily and will have an impact on geopolitics and the mindset behind leading uh, the global community at least politically and economically so that also is a reason for transform transformation people who did not transform after trump took over suffered people who will not transform if trump loses will suffer people who will refuse to transform if trump wins they will also suffer because Trump will be even a different kind of Trump. I'm not talking politically now, I'm talking in terms of history and leadership in his second term because he has nothing to lose now. And people behave differently, uh, president behave differently in the second term. So that's also another reason to, to transform. Now, how do you transform? There are a number of philosophical concepts and also practical concepts that you need to take into considerations while you're thinking about transformation. Um, as I said, these are fundamentals. Now, I know for sure that you know them. But as I always say when I talk about leadership, this is not about intellectual uh, conversation. If you have read 50 leadership books and you have like 600 degrees and 50 PhDs, right? And it's all in your mind, but you don't exercise what you learn and what you know, it is completely useless. So I always go to the fundamentals and make sure that when I'm advising companies as an advisor or as a member of the board of directors, executive or non-executive, or in my job, you know, a career as CEO, what matters to me more is whether you put what you know into action. Otherwise, it's just uh, political or uh, intellectual conversation at a theoretical level. So let's go to them and let's see how you can put them into action because without them, you cannot transform. The principle number one is to what? is to let go of whatever is not necessary anymore. The reason that COVID-19 has changed the world is that it has made us discover abruptly that there's so many things in life we don't change, we don't need anymore. And I'll give you a very classical example. Many companies have just discovered that they don't really need to have all their staff in the same place. This is the most classical example. And now they said even if COVID-19 disappears, we don't really need people uh, in our uh, in our premises anymore so working from home is going to be the norm from now on right so wherever technological advances were already in place but they were not properly utilized before COVID-19 has pushed us to adopt permanently so and that means we change the way we live that means we have to let go of what is not necessary anymore and that's how nature works. That's how evolution works. What the DNA does 
in the process of evolution is that it lets go of all the genes that is not necessary anymore. That's what was happening to us. We are losing an, our wisdom tooth now. Why? Because we don't need it. So whatever has no need is not needed anymore. Nature discards it and we have to do the same. So you as you lead your companies, departments, organizations, countries, families, con whatever, is businesses, you have to decide what do you really don't need and you have to have the courage to let go of because that takes courage because we're usually attached to them. There's no time for sentiments or nostalgia. We have enough time to have to prove that the old, some of the old things do not need, are not needed anymore. So it's time to let them go and you have to decide what that is and you have to act on it because leadership is action. It's not just talk, it's action. The second thing that you have to think about in the process of leading transformation is what is the core assets that you have, the strengths that you need to absolutely protect? What is that you need to protect? Your core strengths. Now, theoretically you know that, but have you really defined it? If you define what is your core strengths of your company, organization, university, family, you know, culture, community, e economy, finances, business, whatever it is which line of business is core, whatever it is, you have to absolutely define what your core strengths is. And this has been already highlighted because the, the crisis, although it has a health facade, it has also a manifested economic and practical and technological you know, dimensions. And it, it became obvious what is core to us, what should be protected, what we cannot do without, right? So you have to decide in your own case study that you're thinking about now as we talk, what is core that you should keep in your mind because it is absolutely your main source of strength. The third one is what should you acquire as a new element? What is it that you don't have that you should acquire? Skills, knowledge, technology, thinking, mindset, habits, values, virtues, ways of behavior, ways of communication, you name it. What is it that you need to learn that you don't know is completely new to you and to your department, team, people, community, nation, you name it. We have to acquire that. And you have to make a conscious and intelligent, smart decision on defining it and on make, putting the right mechanisms to ensure that this is incorporated in your system. The fourth one is what should be underemphasized? What should you do less of? It is not core, but it's important, but you don't need to do it as much as you did, but you can't get rid of it because you need it. So what should be underemphasized in your company, organization, department, and the rest? And the fifth one is what should be overemphasized? What should you do more of? So this is how biology and evolution works. And this is how leadership should be working in terms of its philosophical thinking, its roadmap, its philosophical pillars of thinking, of, of planning, right, of strategizing, so that it can mobilize people along these uh, pillars. And this has to be applied on two dimensions, physiologically and psychologically. So think of your physiological dimension, right, business, structure, you know, whatever it is, anything that is materialistic and physical, and in terms of mindset, intellect, skills, values, virtues, <coughs> culture. So on the psychology and on the physiology level, you have to apply all these components, what you keep, discard, underline, and underemphasize, overemphasize, and, and what you learn as a new skill. It has to happen at, at these three dimensions. And it has to apply to the following types of adaptations. There are a number of times of transformations, right? You have to do them at in synchronization mode. What are they? The structural adaptation. So what do you have to change on a structural level, right? The fundamentals, the structures. The second one is the procedural, the way you do things, the how of things, procedures and policies and regulations and and way of doing things the third one is the mindset the mentality the intellectual one you know the way we think about them and the fourth one of course it is the behavioral one how do we act so if you fail in terms of leading transformation 
at any of these, uh, the chances that you will survive and grow in dealing with a post-COVID threat or challenge at a local, domestic, personal, you know, developmental, departmental, global, national level will fail. You need to think at that level because you and I already have problems and we're already in a crisis management mode. So COVID made everything much worse and what's coming might be even bigger. So we need to act at that level. We cannot take this lightly uh, anymore. And we have to do that with a positive mindset because this is the nature of reality. This is not a disaster, ladies and gentlemen. This is what's happening is not a catastrophe. It's not a disaster. This is the nature of reality. This is not, oh my God, no. Every generation had its own challenges. And in my thinking, every 10 years or so, seven to 10 years, every human being or family or business or society or community or structure or you know an entire system will be facing a tsunami at that level. So we have to take it with a positive mindset because it's the nature of reality and you can't argue with reality because every time you argue with reality, you fail. Reality always wins. So make sure that you have a positive mindset. This is not a panic mindset. This is how to, how to be a realist not how to panic. This is not a crisis. It is much more important because it's fundamental. The other thing that you have to keep in mind is that adaptation is a constant process. This is not a once in a lifetime thing. And you know that for, for sure. But it doesn't matter if you and I know it. We have to make it our way of living. Now, it doesn't have to be a stressful situation. It has to be a way of life. Now, we all need stability, right? Because that's human nature. But we should always plan things so that a part of reality is always unstable. We're always 10%, 20%, something is changing around us. And we do have to do this strategically if we're thinking with a leadership mindset so that the system does not rest. It is not destabilized because otherwise it will panic and be paralyzed and it will freeze or, or will be, you know, we'll lose, uh, we'll lose concentration. At the same time, it will not be, you know, stuck in a stagnation zone. They call it comfort zone. I call it the diminishing zone because what happens is that you're not really comfortable. You're dying slowly without noticing. So it's a diminishing zone. That's my definition of it. It's not a comfort zone. So what you do is you do adaptation as a constant mindset, but you do it with a positive approach because you celebrate it and you make it part of your challenge as you go forward in the journey of survival and growth. So how do you do that? You have to have you have to be good in building a compelling story to sell and you have to emphasize on the benefits. So in your company, your country, you have to build a compelling story. If it's not a compelling story, it is very hard to ask people to engage in a process of transformation because with transformation, there will be pain because it's major change. So you have to emphasize the benefits that relate to them. That's how you make it compelling. You have to make it a survival and growth opportunity issue for your audience. So you build a compelling story. Then you make, you create a state of urgency because people will never transform or not, I'm not talking about change. I'm talking about real fundamental transformation. I'm, I'm talking about, you know, turnaround. I'm talking about, you know, what Lee Kuan Yew did to Singapore. I'm talking about what Gandhi did to India. I'm talking about during the process of independence. I'm talking about you know, nation builders did to create their nation. I'm talking about Lou Gerstner, the way he changed IBM. I'm talking about Steve Jobs, the way he changed Apple after he took over. So you have to create a state of urgency. Otherwise, no urgency. People will not be gearing towards transformation. They will take it easy. You have to light fire under their chair so that they can move so fast. But you have to do it intelligently through a compelling, motivating story that emphasizes the benefits. And you have to involve everybody, of course, because if they're not involved, they will become a force uh, that you will be have a burden on you. So the more involved people around you in your department, in your team, in your family, the more you bring them, make them part of this transformation team, give them ownership, the easier it will become. Also, you have to create a spearhead team, right? You have to create a spearhead team. Just look like, look at the spear. What really does the penetration is not the entire body. It's like the spear is like a two meter thing or two and a half meter thing. The part that does the penetration is the metal 
arrow at the at the at the at the, at the top. So you have to create that metal arrow that will penetrate. So you have to find a team that will spearhead. If you look at the bell curve, right, the majority is under the bell, right. The minority are lagging behind. They will drag you. The, the middle are passive and they're easily uh, oriented by opinion leaders, by influencers. And then the minority on the side are people who are enthusiastic. They get it. So you have to know how to define them and use them as your core team of commando, of strike force, of your elite force. So that they become, they create momentum and they create change and they inspire and lead the majority that is lagging behind. And you have to know how to define these people and motivate them. Then you have to over communicate. Again, I'm telling you things that probably most of you know, but as I said, the, the test is not in knowing them intellectually, because if you fail in applying any of these, then the transformation will suffer and your survival and growth, especially in times of crisis like COVID and post COVID will suffer and you will pay the consequences. So over communicate as much as you can. And the moment you thought that you have over communicated, you're not even halfway through. You will get bored, fed up, tired. It doesn't matter. Keep saying it until people get fed up. And when they get fed up, don't stop. Keep doing it. Become a broken record because people pretend that they'll get it, but they didn't. Right. So keep saying it until you lose your breath. That's how it works with people. Then you have to know how to reframe the issue of stress. So you have to change from a stress situation into a positive situation. You have to move it from stress into excitement, stress into a challenge, stress into a race, stress into competition. So you have to reframe the tension that we built that will come up with your system as it goes into dealing with the post COVID uh, threats to your survival and growth. So you have to reframe it. And that also requires a smart and intelligent leadership skills to know how to present it. Of course, you have to please respect the past because people will be losing their past that they adore and they're attached to and they have memories with. So you have to respect it and honor it so that people don't go against you. Otherwise, you will suffer. You have to be empathetic as much as possible. Be empathetic because people will be in pain and you have to hold them and grab them and hug them and be sympathetic and empathetic to their pains. Otherwise, you will disconnect with them and they will not follow you. They need you to be a human being. Leadership is about being a human being because you're leading humans and humans are mind and heart, not just mind. They're also heart. You have to lead with your heart and your mind. Use all your resources because you will need them. Transformation is a super hard job, right? So use every tool you have. Don't let anybody, anything, you know, saved. Use all your weapons. This is the major weapon of your survival and growth. So use every possible resource, right? Continuously reassess because you will get it wrong and you will have to continuously evaluate so that you refine your moving forward process. This is the process of transformation to prepare for post COVID survival and growth and for the current reality. Keep a learning mindset because as you will assess the situation, you will have to learn so that you can apply what you learned and refine, keep fine tuning, fine tuning, fine tuning, because nobody gets it right from the first time. You will also need to get all the help that you can because nobody can do it alone. So this is not time for arrogance. You have to be open minded and humble. You can do it alone. This is not about your story of heroism. This is about succeeding in mobilizing people. So get all the help that you can. Right. Don't make it about you. It's not about ego. Of course, there will be resistance. So you have to learn how to deal with resistance. You have to do that intelligently. Right. And there is an entire dynamic. I have written a 500 page book about how to deal with uh, how to deal with resistance. I'll show you the book now. It's not an advertisement, but you will like you will like the, the, the you will like the title. It's called How to Trump the enemy right it's the trump the trump here does not mean trump as a president it means how do you overcome and outsmart uh, the competition and it's a 500 page uh, thing 480 right it's all about how do you strategic strategies for dealing with your leadership opponents why is this important because when people's leadership effort fail transformation fail not because of lack of allies is because of lack 
of how to deal with your opponents, saboteurs, your resistors, and they will be at different categories in all aspects of your reality. Internal, external, family, friends, colleagues, constituencies, competition, you name it, right? So you have to know how to do that, right? Otherwise, transformation will fail. Of course, you have to be persistent, right? Be persistent because this is a long, long, long journey. And if you're not persistent, you will give up. It is going to be bumpy, full of failures and successes. Get ready, get ready. This is going to be a very difficult journey, right? There's going to be a lot of turbulences. So fasten your seatbelt, celebrate every success, learn from every failure. It is not going to be an easy ride. Never give up because this is going to be uh, one of the most important journeys of your life to save your company, your family, your department, your country. Otherwise, if you don't survive, you die. If you don't grow, you will not survive and then you will die. It's not a matter of, it's not a luxury. You have to do that. And my last two slides is adapt or die you know that it is not this is not uh, and this has never have been true as it is now because of the current challenge and but because of what's coming next i'm not just worried about the, you know of course i'm worried about the the, the 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 health issues but i see from a geopolitical macro perspective the next five ten years god help us it's going to be really really turbulent as this stress continues to manifest itself on the different facets of societies everywhere this is just the beginning right you know it's like divorce i know it's a bad thing but, uh, but it's, uh, maybe it's not a nice example uh, the w w most of the problems of divorce happen after you know when you start the process after the consequences right so because then shows things come to the surface so so adapt or die and the la my last point ladies and gentlemen is that in the end in the end in the end all of this comes to one point it is a leadership challenge you this cannot happen without leadership take out leadership all of this will fail the reason societies have failed is not because they did not understand the situation it's not because they did not diagnose it properly it is not that because they didn't have the intellectual capacity to come up with solutions it's not that because they don't have smart people it's not that because they don't know how to articulate it but the things things are they are the way they are now is because of shortage of leadership because the core of leadership is to mobilize people through the journey of survival and trans and growth and that's what at stake now it's all about now how do we make it through COVID, and how do we turn this into an opportunity for humanity and for your country and for all the countries of the world and for your organization and yourself thank you so much thank you for listening to the michael cooley podcast please visit cooleyinstitute.com and send us an email we would love to hear your comments and thoughts on this episode. And remember to follow Michael's continuous learning insights on social media.